Our monthly newsletter, The Fireside, features articles about the New Deal and its relevance to today, as well as upcoming events and public programs like this one. Our upcoming webinars include Painting the Mail, New Deal Post Office Art, with New Deal art historian Barbara Bernstein on November 16th and Reality Makes Them Dream on December 6th about New Deal photographers with SF MoMA curator Emmy Nikovicius and Josie Johnson, curator at the Cantor Art Center at Stanford University. We'll also be hosting a webinar with filmmakers Deborah Kaufman and Alan Snittow about their latest documentary, Town Destroyer, premiering this week at the Mill Valley Film Festival. Town Destroyer looks at the ongoing controversy over the life of Washington murals by New Deal artist Victor Arnatoff, which drew international attention when the San Francisco School Board voted to cover up the murals that some students and parents at George Washington High School condemned for depictions of Native Americans and African American slaves in Washington's time. Town Destroyer is a powerful film. I'll put a link to the trailer in the chat so that you can pre preview it if you like. Check out our website for updates and sign up for the Fireside to be notified about upcoming webinars. Our guests tonight are Susan Quinn and Dan Jacobs. Susan is the author of several books, including biographies of psychoanalyst Karen Horney and scientist Marie Curry. She's the author of Eleanor and Hick, The Love Affair That Shaped a First Lady, and of Furious Improvisation, How the WPA and a Cast of Thousands Made High Art Out of Desperate Times, the story of the Federal Theater Project and its dynamic director, Hallie Flanagan. Dan Jacobs is supervising analyst at the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute and director of the Center for Advanced Psychoanalytic Studies at Princeton. He is the author of several publications, including a novel, The Distance from Home. Dan and Susan have been co-writing a play, Enter Hallie, about Hallie Flanagan and the Federal Theater Project. Tonight's conversation includes a reading from their play. You can join the conversations by writing your questions into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, and we hope you enjoy tonight's program. We look forward to seeing you at Living New Deal webinars this fall. Your donations make our work and programs like this available to everyone free of charge, and we depend on your support. Welcome, and thank you, Susan and Dan, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Susan. We're so pleased to be here. Uh, we have three ideas of what we'd like to cover this evening. The first is to tell the story of the Federal Theater and its achievements uh, the, uh, uh, in, in a way that's different from uh, what uh, Sue's beautiful book, A Furious Improvisation, tells that story, but we're going to tell it again in a different way. Uh, Sue is going to give a brief talk with slides. And that will be followed, as Susan said, uh, with a brief reading from our play, Enter Halley. Uh, so, Susan. And then the second objective is to tell you about Halley Flanagan's life before and after the Federal Theater. Right. And then to discuss with you the process in uh, trying to develop uh, a play uh, from Halley's personal and public life, a play that will have some relevance to our time. We're going to start with this slideshow. So I, all of you here, we're calling this the Federal Theater Revisiting the Dream. I know everybody here is well aware that the Great Depression of the 1930s was devastating to farmers and city folks alike. Like, next slide. Old charities like the Red Cross were way too timid to do the job. Here we see a starving farmer holding up a package of garden seed that was supplied by the Red Cross. But garden seed was just not going to do it because his fields have been destroyed like thousands of others by the by the Dust Bowl. Next slide. 
desperate farmers headed west in droves, leaving the Dust Bowl behind. Next slide. And next slide. And in the cities, there were long bread lines everywhere. People were out of work and hungry. Among those hardest hit were artists, writers and visual artists, musicians, also theater workers. And the Roosevelt administration's WPA created four programs to address the desperate situation among creative people, a writer's project, a music project, a visual arts project, and a theater project. The mission of the Federal Theater Project was to put unemployed theater workers back to work as quickly as possible. Actors, singers, dancers, writers, backstage workers. The Federal Theater succeeded in doing this to an astonishing degree. The person who made this happen was a 46-year-old five-foot dynamo named Hallie Flanagan. Hallie was teaching at Vassar College when the WPA boss, Harry Hopkins, recruited her to head up the Federal Theater Project in 1935. Harry knew Hallie back at Grinnell. They were in school together, and he'd followed her career. He, he knew that she was a very popular teacher at Vassar, and her plays were unusual and original enough to attract the attention of New York Times critics. She also was the first woman ever to receive a Guggenheim, and she used her Guggenheim grant to spend a year traveling around Russia and the European continent, meeting all of the leading directors and seeing hundreds, maybe hundreds, many, many plays wherever she went. Um, so it, it, ha it was pretty clear, knowing Hallie Flanagan, that she was not going to just put theater people to work. She was also going to be innovative. And she was innovative. But what's surprising to me, as I look back over her accomplishments, is how inclusive she was in her efforts to put people back to work. All over the country, every kind of entertainment was given new life with the support of the Federal Theater Project. Next. There was vaudeville. Next. And next. There was circus. There's an outdoor circus, and here's the clown, obviously. And there were truck shows brought to large outdoor audiences in city parks. Here we see a truck show, and you, if you see in the background, this is a I'm not sure where this is, somewhere in New York, I think, but very modest housing and hundreds of people turning out for this show. And <clears throat> there were similar uh, truck shows that toured the country from small town to small town and brought the sets and the actors along and uh, opened the shows uh, along these, these roads. Or even shows for the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC men, uh, boys, they were called. They were boys, a lot of them. They were really young um, in the camps. The show they the, the did for the CCC was called the CCC Murder Mystery. And it traveled to 258 different CCC camps. There were children's shows, too, all across the country. And here's a scene from one of them from Pinocchio. And here is a rapt audience of children watching a federal theater production. I think this is a very wonderful slide. So, uh, so one of the earliest and most spectacular of the federal theater productions was an all-black Macbeth put on at the Lafayette Theater in Harlem. At the time, Black theater actors were cast in minor stereotype roles, what they called handkerchief head roles, and not much else. There were no, there was no opportunity for actors to perform, black actors to perform in serious plays, let alone Shakespeare. Even, even Othello was usually, Othello was usually a white actor in blackface. So uh, the originator and director of this Macbeth was a young and little known Orson Welles. 
There he is. Wells got the idea of moving the story, Macbeth, to Haiti and modeled the character of Macbeth after the Haitian dictator Toussaint Louverture. Here, next slide, we see the actor Jack Carter in the role of Macbeth in the original production in Harlem. Here in the next scene, we see a dueling Macbeth in the one of the finals, the, the duel between Macduff and Macbeth. Here you see how extravagant the costumes are. This is the picture of the witches and what became known, this production became known as Voodoo Macbeth. The costumes and the sets were by a black designer, Nat Carson. Here you see Macbeth in the middle surrounded by the witches and then in the background, this haunting kind of eerie luminescent set uh, with these large bones. Uh, that was the work of, um, of, of Nat Carson. On opening night, next, Hallie Flanagan met the press outside the Lafayette Theater. She looks very serious here, but she was actually, I know, I can assure you she was very happy that night uh, with the success of, of the opening, as were the crowd outside the Lafayette Theater in Harlem. Next slide. Voodoo Macbeth had a long run to sold out houses in Harlem, followed by a successful national tour. The federal theater policy towards blacks was highly unusual at the time. At Holly Flanagan's insistence, casts and audiences were integrated. Black stagehands were excluded from theatrical unions were hired for federal theater productions. And there was an active and successful effort to stage all black productions. Next. In Chicago, there was a production of Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado uh, called Swing Mikado, which was a swing version of Mikado. Uh, it it uh, was hugely popular and had sold out audiences for weeks in advance. Um, it toured the country and wound up, in fact, on Broadway. Next slide. Next where a critic called it one of the most enjoyable nights of the Gotham season. This is uh, Swing Mikado again. Uh, the Negro theater troops performed contemporary theater as well. Uh, here's a scene from a production of Eugene O'Neill's Beyond the Horizon. Next, next slide. And here, next slide a poster for the Seattle Negro Units version of the Greek drama, the Greek comedy, Lysistrata. Looking back over the federal theater story, some years after I wrote the book, I've been struck by how much joy there was, how much fun people had, um, despite the gloom of the depression, which surrounded everything. Um, and there was an instance of this, a production called Horse Eats Hot. Next slide. Horse Eats Hot was based very loosely on a French farce, and it was made up of sort of a bizarre collection of aging character actors and comedy actors and vaudeville actors for whom there hadn't been an obvious place, placement. And um, it was directed by Orson Welles. Uh, it was nothing but an orgy of pratfalls and wild chases and collapsing scenery. It puzzled some critics and some audiences, some members of the audience, but those who got it became repeaters. Some coming back 10, 20, 30 times to see it. Uh, and uh, tickets were 55 cents, so it wasn't so hard to do that. Uh, on closing night, next slide. This is also Horsey's hat. On closing night, only those who had seen it before, only those who had seen it before were allowed in. So one of the most original of Hallie Flanagan's gambits was something called the Living Newspaper, an idea based on workers' theater production she'd seen in Russia, and also um, at, at Union um, 
productions, a few union productions here in the United States of of such things. Um, the, the, the federal theater's living newspapers had the great advantage of putting large numbers of people to work in plays that could accommodate many styles. They could include farce and, 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 and dance and vaudeville and music. They even put journalists to work, providing documentation on a wide range of pressing current issues. The first living newspaper was based on a very current issue, Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. Even before it opened, the production attracted, here, this is Haile Selassie, by the way, um, and uh, next to him is, a, is an African drummer, obviously. But this, uh, this living newspaper attracted the attention of the Roosevelt administration, which was trying to stay out of the fray between Mussolini and Haile Selassie. And it, this living newspaper never got past the final dress rehearsal. However, other living newspapers were more successful. One called Power, next slide, made a strong case for public ownership of utilities. Next. This is a scene from a living newspaper about agriculture and about Roosevelt policies towards agriculture. It was called Triple A Plowed Under. And it was a multi-dimensional look at, at the strengths and weaknesses of the New Deal's farm policy. Next slide. Roosevelt had said that one third of the nation was ill-housed, ill-clad, and ill-nourished. And that phrase formed the basis of another living newspaper called One Third of a Nation. Next. Next slide, thanks. Uh, originally, the script had, well, this is, this is One Third of a Nation's New York set. And uh, as you can see, there's a fire. And at the beginning and the end of One Third of a Nation, there was a fire in this tenement housing. And that was to illustrate, dramatize the cyclical nature of um, fire and hazards in um, tenement housing. Um, but when they did the one third of a nation in Philadelphia, there had recently been a collapse of a tenement building. So instead of a fire, they dramatized it with the tenement collapsing, followed by stretchers bearing injured people out of the building. So one of the great nights of the Federal Theater was October 27, 1936, the night of a production of Sinclair Lewis's It Can't Happen Here. Next slide. It Can't Happen Here opened on 21 different stages in 21 different versions in 21 different locations all around the United States. The premise of the play was that, in fact, it could happen here. It wouldn't take much of a push to turn the United States into a fascist dictatorship. Next slide. Another poster and another poster. Next slide. And finally, here's a scene from It Can't Happen Here. This happens to be the Yiddish production of It can Happen Here. And the man who's standing is the heroic newspaper editor. Um, and the seated guy with the boots is a, what they call the fascist corpo, which was the play's version of the Gestapo. Next slide. One of the last triumphs of the Federal Theater took place on Treasure Island in, at the Golden Gate International Exposition in San Francisco. There, productions opened in the only theater ever built for the project. Eleanor Roosevelt came to congratulate Halley and to take in the performance. The Federal Theater consumed one-tenth of one percent of the federal budget. According to Hallie Flanagan's careful accounting, that amounted to $46,208,000, the cost, as she often said, of one battleship. And for those dollars, 10,000 theater people 
were put back to work. And each of those 10,000 was supporting on average four dependents over four over the four years of their employment. And hundreds of thousands were entertained. The majority of them, 65% of the shows were free of charge altogether. As the critic Brooks Atkinson put it, for a socially useful achievement, it would be hard among the relief projects to beat the federal theater, which has brought art and ideas within the range of millions of people all over the country. But the success and visibility of the federal theater attracted the attention of right wing, right wing critics of the New Deal, and in particular, the hostile attention of the House Un-American Activities Committee, which was chaired by a racist Texas congressman named Martin Dyes. Eventually, Dyes and his committee managed to shut down the federal theater and end a rare moment in our history when federal funds supported live and exciting theater all across the nation. Uh, now uh, we'll do two brief scenes from our play, uh, Enter Halley, in which we see dies in action, uh, interviewing in the first scene an actress, and then um, Hallie Flanagan defending herself before dies. Uh, so if it helps, close your eyes, imagine this on stage, or imagine yourself in the congressional hearing room. I now call to order this meeting of the House Committee of Un-American Activities. Uh, Chairman Martin Dyes presiding. We will first hear from Miss Sally Saunders, actress. Miss Saunders, can you tell us why you are here today? Because you invited me? Yes, but, but, but for what reason? You have something to tell us? I certainly do. I was playing in a federal theater production. I didn't much care for it. There were Negroes in the cast. But I needed the work. I couldn't believe my ears when a Negro actor asked me if I was free that night. Was I free that night? Like I might go out with him. That's what's going on in the federal theater. Races mixing on stage and in the audience. And did you tell anyone, Mrs. Saunders? Yes, I complained, and real quick, to my director, Mr. Harold Hex. And what happened then? Oh, nothing. He told me that that Negro actor had as much right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as I had. He is free to insult a woman, I asked. Free to speak his mind, Mr. Hex said. Well, what kind of person tolerates a white woman being insulted like that? A communist person. I should say that these, many of these words, most of them are verbatim from the congressional record. Uh, so what you heard uh, Sally say was in fact what she did say in, in the 1930s. Uh, the next scene is uh, one uh, where Hallie Flanagan at last appears. There have been many uh, witnesses like Sally Saunders that had been called before Hallie was finally called uh, to defend herself. I now call to order uh, the meeting, this meeting of the House Un-American Activities Committee. Chairman Martin Dyes presiding. For the record, the date is December 6, 1938. Proceed, Mrs. Flanagan. Since 1935, I have been concerned with combating un-American inactivity. Inactivity? The inactivity of professional men and women, people who, when I took office, were on the relief rolls 
At that time, this committee might well have investigated as un-American the long lines of people unemployed through no fault of their own, broken, ill, despairing, bitter, rebellious. It is rebelliousness in your plays, Mrs. Flanagan, that I want to talk to you about today. Isn't it true that all over these United States, the federal theater is producing plays that are out and out communist propaganda? Our plays are not about communism. They're about democracy, about better housing and workers' rights. And aren't you stirring up racial conflict with putting Negroes and whites on stage together? Hunger is colorblind, Congressman. So those are the, the two brief scenes. Uh, and uh, we'll turn this back over to Susan for some questions and continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you both for that little preview of your, of your play. I know that you've been uh, working on this for, for quite a while. How, how did you come to the idea of uh, making a play from impro and furious improvisation? Well, I, I think when I read Sue's book and learned about uh, not only the Federal Theater, but Halley's life, it was so full of drama before and after uh, she uh, spent the four years of the Federal Theater that I thought actually uh, her, her struggles, her life in and out of the Federal Theater uh, needed to be told. And we wanted to, we thought about doing it in the medium that she loved the most, which was theater. So could we put her life on stage in some way? that uh, that people would enjoy, but also learn learn about her and the Federal Theater and the struggles of women, actually, as well. Yeah. So. Um, Susan, could you talk a little bit about um, Hallie's life and give us some insight into who she was and how she was chosen to direct the Federal Theater Project? Yes. Um, she was born in Grinnell in 1889 um, and uh, uh, was uh, right at the start of going to college in Grinnell. She became passionate about theater and even then about directing more than acting. Um, she was in love with the, well, with, uh, what, what, what more would you say? Go ahead. Well, well yeah. I think uh, actually uh, just to summarize her life really quickly. Uh, she raised in Grinnell. She goes to Grinnell College where she meets her uh, husband, uh, Murray. Murray Flanagan, and she also uh, is friendly with Harry Hopkins. Uh, she marries at age uh, 23. By age 30, she is a widow with two children two young children. Her, her husband dies of TB and she goes with him at the end to Colorado and you know away from the children. That's the first leaving. Yeah, the of first, many. The first yeah. leaving of the children yeah. is when she yeah. goes to Colorado and actually uh, rents a room uh, and visits uh, uh, Murray, who's in a sanit uh, sanitarium every every day takes small jobs she's afraid to even tell uh, her husband uh, about. Uh, but she returns at age 30, a widow with two children, returns to Grinnell to her uh, parents' house. And uh, she uh, throws herself into, the, into theater. And actually, that's one of the main points, that theater saves her. It becomes her baby. Because actually, in 19, uh, when she is 33, she loses one of her children to meningitis. Fred, the, old, the older two, of the, a, two uh, uh, the older one is, is oh, not, I forget. well, anyway, the, the eldest boy, is yeah. seven when Jack, Jack, when, yeah. Jack dies yeah. when, when uh, she is 33, he is seven. So, she is left bereft and she in a way has to save herself and does so by uh, 
involving herself even more in theater. She goes to the um, Baker workshop, Baker workshop in, uh, at Harvard for a year, uh, leaving Fred when he is about uh, four. Uh, she then goes on the Guggenheim for a year, leaving him when with, he is with grandparents. I mean, uh, yeah, he, she leaves him with with caring, yeah. really caring grandparents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she leaves him, and she has to do something for herself after these terrible uh, tragedies. So uh, then, of course, uh, she comes back from the Guggenheim, teaches at uh, Vassar, and our play opens with showing her. Uh, directing students in Antony and Cleopatra uh, at, uh, at Vassar. And then, uh, of course, in, at age 45, she's called to uh, be uh, the director of the Federal Theater. And why, why is she chosen other than being uh, a friends with Harry? I think it's mostly being a friend with Harry. Well, I mean, she had all the qualifications. She was obviously dynamic and talented and smart and all those things. But I think it was the, the connection to Harry and his knowing her that uh, made him decide. There were other there were other candidates, um, but uh, he chose Hallie. She was the of the four directors of the arts program. She was the only woman, uh, and it was a daunting task. I mean, you know, nobody knew exactly. Nobody knew what they were doing. You know, I mean. They, they started by getting connected as much as possible to all the existing regional theaters all around the United States. But I mean, we're talking about thousands and thousands of people who they wound up being able to employ in the federal theater. It's, it's, it's kind of astounding. I think, I think we try to capture that, uh, that fervor and that improvisation in the, in the scene where she's interviewing acrobats uh, the phone's ringing. Uh, she's uh, she tries to get a, a producer to take these acrobats in a scene uh, in a play in Hamlet, telling him you know you have to fit them in. She uh, interviews older people who've been in vaudeville and who waltz around in front of her, uh, trying to impress her. So there is a sense of her her dynamic creative efforts and the people that she has to find work for. Uh, yeah. So that, that's, I think, uh, uh, amazing in terms yeah. of what she was able to accomplish. It's sort of a paradoxical story for anyone who's been involved in theater because always everybody's worrying about large casts, you know, <laughs> because they're so expensive. Um, but this was a situation where the larger, the better. And uh, she was quite, uh, innovative, I think, about the way she put people back to work. Yeah, there's a scene where uh, she uh, she interviews these uh, two Chinese uh, directors who want to put on a play with six performance, a classical Mandarin play, and she says, "Now, you know, come back when you have a hundred actors in this, because uh, we can't we can't put on a show with just six people. We have to employ as many people as possible." Yeah, um, I thank you. Yeah, um, we're getting a few questions and in, including mine. So um, I was curious about um, the Federal Theater Project seemed to go out of its way to reflect the nation's diversity, um, including for some non English speaking audiences. Um, could you talk about that? Yeah, it, that, that was amazing to me. Um, a lot, a lot of Yiddish theater. Of course, there was a very strong tradition of Yiddish theater in New York, but also uh, theater in French, theater in German, theater in Italian, in, in New Jersey and Boston, uh, theater in Spanish. Uh, and so, the, uh, yes, and not, of course, also ethnic diversity and this big effort really to involve um, African Americans. Which, which the Federal Theater did very successfully. Yeah, um, Sue um, had written an article for the, the Fireside about the Federal Theater Project and, and it had a lot of information about the, the Negro Theater Project and its lasting impacts. Could you talk about that? 
Yes. Uh, well, I think, uh, of course, the, the well, Orson Welles's Voodoo Macbeth just resonated down through the ages. I think anyone who's interested in theater knows about it. Um, but it, there was a lot of, um, um, the, I think the Negro Ensemble Company and subsequent all black companies have, have definitely um, inherited the tradition of, of, of the federal theater. I, one of the things that comes out in the Dye's testimony that's interesting is, um, I think you had asked me, Susan, about um, what, what were the controversies that the federal theater e evoked and got in trouble over. And there were a number of pretty daring things that they did. One was a, ch a children's production called Revolt of the Beavers, which is about <laughs> all these beavers on roller skates and they had a really mean boss and they were plotting against them and forming a union. And um, some critics said that it was uh, Marxism a la Mother Goose. Well, actually, <laughs> and, uh, the police commissioner of New York tried to shut it down. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and then there was a, a play called Stevedore, and this speaks to the to the race issue. Uh, that was a play about a black man who was accused of raping a white woman, and it was and he was innocent, but he was accused by a white woman who was protecting her. I guess her lover, I can't remember the details. But the thing about it that came up in the Dyes hearings was that this was the period of the Scottsboro boys uh, who were uh, falsely accused uh, in the South of um, molesting a white woman and were, and there, that was, a, that was a, a cause of the progressive, of, of the progressive movement. And clearly, even though it's not mentioned, the parallels between Stevedore and that, that issue were very much present. Um, and, but I think that what was really controversial and really bothered the, the Southern Congressman and the House on American Activities Committee was integration. And the fact that they insisted on integrated audiences. I was amazed to read recently a, a, from my book, <laughs> I'd forgotten, that, uh, that not all the theaters on Broadway um, were integrated that insist, insisted on integrated audiences. The group theater did, and a couple of other progressive theaters, but um, there were segregated audiences in in New York. Um, it's hard for us to now to believe that, but yeah. um, anyway, she, her, her policies were, they were pretty, they were pushing the envelope. Well, I think that's what the federal theater is about, breaking out in many ways. It, broke out in terms of integration. It broke out in terms of new ways of presenting theater. I mean, uh, Burnham Woods uh, become coconut trees, if you can imagine, and yeah. Voodoo Macbeth. Uh, it's, it's breaking out in so many interesting, innovative, progressive ways that are eventually bound to stir up uh, conservatives. Yeah. Did um, did Hallie have any allies in the administration? Well, she had Harry Hopkins, who was with her. What happened with Harry Hopkins was the war. What happened with Harry Hopkins was the lead up. The, the lead up to the war began to shift priorities, and there was more and more pressure on him to cut back on spending on culture on all these cultural programs. And, and of course, the, the federal theater was, was such an obvious target, um, you know, and so it, it was the first, the first one that Congress went after. They went after the other arts programs too, as you know, but, um, but what priorities began to shift in about 38, 39, the um, Treasure Island, which was this beautiful installation of buildings, including the Federal Theater building, they all got torn down and it was really turned into a, a naval base and military training base in 3940. You know, and so one well, of the one of the things that killed the Federal Theater was World War Two, you know, and the lead up to that, but also these other prejudices. Yeah, I think I think uh Harry Hopkins kind of 
uh, has to give it up. And yeah. that's, that's part of the play. I mean, she accuses him of wanting to be Secretary of Commerce and, and backing off of the Federal Theater for his own personal ambitions. I'm not sure that's true, but certainly, uh, you know, well, it, maybe a little bit. The, yeah. the, the Federal Theater was Hallie's baby. It was her baby. She'd mm -hmm. lost a baby. Mm -hmm. She couldn't lose this one. And yet, of course, she does. And that's part of the drama of what we try to present in Enter Hallie, that actually Hopkins in the play says to her when he when she accuses him of not supporting the theater sufficiently, he says, this is your baby. Fight for it. And she does. Yeah. Were um, were federal theater prod productions done in, in the South? Yes, yes. and in some, in some places in the South, and that that was a, a problem because in some places, um, actually, there was a there was an instance in Dallas, I think, where um, they actually refused to perform because the Dallas the government or whoever wouldn't allow the audience to be integrated. Um, but I, I'm not entirely clear how they negotiated that integrated audience issue in the South. I, I didn't find evidence of what, what, how that happened, but, you know, the, but the, but the federal theater was also made up of regional theaters. So it may be that some of those places in the South dealt differently with the race issue in terms of audiences. So, yeah. Um, one of the questions we have, um, comes from someone who wanted to thank you for helping her find out about the Federal One through your book. Oh. Um, she's uh, Sue DeMassey. She wrote the book about um, the biography of, of Henry Alsberg. But oh, yeah. She, yeah, she she has an interesting question. She Most of us know what we know about the Federal Theater Project through the film, The Cradle Will Rock. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering if that was something that influenced you in writing your play. Well, it didn't. I, I have a whole section about the federal, the uh, cradle wheel rocket. It's a fascinating story. And we, we do have this confrontation between Hallie and Orson Welles in the play. Um, but um, I, I, of course, I, I, I watched the movie and I, I think there's some very moving parts of it, especially where Orson Welles, you know, chooses to march up Broadway and open this, which all happened and open the whole play in another theater and have the actors because of union regulations, they aren't able to be on the stage and they sing the parts from various points in the balcony. Um, you know, so, so I, I think those scenes are amazing and um, they were kind of in some ways painful, very painful for Hallie Flanagan. She felt abandoned by him. And of course, Orson, in his theatrical way, talked about the Cossacks in the Federal Theater Program, you know, of which well, she was the uh, lead Cossack. Yeah, yeah. The, the, and, there was a delay in, in the budget. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, and so they had to delay, delay the opening. And, uh, and uh, Orson thought it was censorship and we do have a uh, their argument about he uh, in the play, and we have someone singing a little bit of a cradle, of cradle rock, of rock, so you yeah. get a feeling for yeah. it. Yeah, but um, but is there but, a relationship between the Actors' Equity and the Federal Theater Project? Yes, um, a lot of negotiation went on about allowing actors to play um, for reduced salaries with the unions, all the unions, also the backstage unions, you know, who were refusing um, to do, to take, to, to work at the rates the federal theater provided. Um, and Hallie, we, there's a scene in our play, and actually there's a scene, an actual scene that happened where she says, you know, either you take this or, you know, you have nothing at all. And you, um, you take, take it or leave salaries, it. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, so that was a back and forth that was, she was constantly negotiating and the theater owners also were very, they were very threatened by the federal theater productions because they were competition, um, you know, uh, and playing by different rules. And, um, and you have to remember that she's a five foot tall woman yeah. facing all of this 
in an era it, of uh, male domination even more than it is oh, yeah. today. I mean, it, everybody in charge was male. She developed, she was, she was a charmer and she developed pretty good relationships with the union bosses and with uh, Schubert, you know, the owner of the Schubert theaters and became uh, an ally. So she, she recruited people to her, to her side a lot. There was a story that, uh, came up when we were, uh, uh, when the um, Voodoo Macbeth was performing in uh, Harlem. And the Federal Theater hired black uh, uh, backstage workers and the union threatened to picket. All white union. This yeah. all white union predict, uh, threatened to picket. And I think that was when, um, I, I think it was Orson Welles. No, no, I, I think it was John Houseman. He said, if, if you seriously think you can picket a theater in Harlem for hiring Negroes, go right ahead. <laughs> um, of course, it never happened. Um, but so there were always, that was, I mean, it was a constant, and that's one of the things we try to convey in this play. You know, she was dealing with all these egos, you know, I mean, this Orson Welles on one hand, and Sinclair Lewis, who was an alcoholic, and, difficult unreliable yeah. and um trying to make it all happen and a lot of times she succeeded um i'm aware that other countries uh notably the uk has a national theater oh, i know was there ever any call for reviving the national theater the federal theater project or something like it here you know i i think People in theater talk about it all the time, you know, and why can't we be like England? But I don't think there have been, there haven't been serious successful efforts in that, in that way. No. Were there lasting impacts of the Federal Theater Project? Well, I mean, there's, there are people still putting on some of those living newspapers and newer versions of them you know, that kind of documentary play. I don't know. Um, well, I think the, they're not obvious ones. Well, don't you think that uh, uh, the influence of the Russian theater with the bare stages uh, and the kind of avant-garde aspects of Russian theater uh, influenced uh, her productions? And I think that was carried on. Uh, you know, afterwards, I think you saw them uh, less scenery uh, uh you know less uh, decoration at least in those plays that were uh, uh more serious that, yeah. that there was that freedom to do it that that i think she brought uh through the american uh through the federal theater to american theater yeah some of that was if you see parallels um between efforts to censor books or ban books or murals that are considered to be offensive and efforts to um you know to control what people read or can see do you see parallels to um to the house on american activities committee uh, absolutely yeah. i mean you you see the fear the same, the same rhetoric is going is going on now about um what people can read and uh, what children in school can read and um, you know that was um, the fear of no ideas of of of, uh, of change I mean the southern uh, the southern democrats the political democrats you know were frightened of any kind of integration so uh, the federal theater was a threat to them a threat to their way of of life yeah. And uh, so, uh, so were the plays about uh, public ownership. I mean, uh, it you know, for capitalists, for serious, greedy capitalists, some of these plays were were really threatening, and they were shown all over the country to to people who'd never seen theater before. Many of them, so. Uh, the, the, it was frightening for just as it, as it is now uh, for uh, what we might consider progress or progressive ideas. Yeah, 
I mean, Howie Flanagan, uh, at the end, she wrote an editorial for the New York Times, which I think the final line was that federal theater taught people to think. Yeah. No, it's really- It's true. dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dangerous. It was, it was dangerous. Well, what happened to uh, Hallie Flanagan after the Federal Theater Project? Well, she she went back to Vassar. Uh, you know, before she uh, she took the Federal Theater job, she had met a professor at Vassar whom she married uh, and who had three young children. So, uh, you know, uh, in the play, there is this conflict about a working woman. How do you balance uh, having uh, children at home and particularly Fred who was an alcoholic, her, her son, her son. And, yeah. and troubled. And how do you balance that with trying to have a, a creative work life as a woman? So that's part of the play too. But she went back and uh, she did a lot of uh, good productions, uh, including yeah. I think T.S. Eliot's yeah. The Murder in the Cathedral yeah. there. Uh, got Times reviews. She, then she did premieres of several premieres. Of them, yeah moved on to Smith, and then at the end of her life, um, developed Parkinson's uh, and ended up in a nursing home dying in 1969. Now, there was a, a, a very brief period when she was in a, a mental hospital, Austin Riggs, I think because really, because she was facing Parkinson's and didn't know it, and was uh, becoming more disturbed. She was, she was uh, depressed. But uh, you know, we we opened uh, our early version. We have Hallie at Austin Riggs telling a psychiatrist who's the audience her story and and going and uh, when we played it at a number of theaters, we audiences readings. Uh, readings, uh, readings. We yeah. had readings in three different uh, theaters. The audience said. Um, She's why why are you portraying her as 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 we in a weakened condition? Portray her as strong. So we went back, and that's part of the rewriting we did for the play. We make her stronger, appear stronger. She, well, and we started we started also at the time of her life when she was, you know, doing things as opposed to having her looking back. Yeah, and it's a much it's a much we think a better a better play that way. A lot, a lot better. Yeah. What, what, what's interesting to us now, and I don't know what will happen, is that uh, when we were in New York, there was a table reading, uh, and a uh, two uh, directors of uh, one uh, of uh, the New Perspective Theater were very encouraging and said this was a story about the Federal Theater and Halley that should be told, and they are willing to work with us on. Um, on uh, a limited, uh, what they call a, a, a showcase, a showcasing showcase. it for maybe 12, 16 performances Performance, yeah. in, in New York. Uh, whether that'll happen now, we are learning about the need for grants, all that stuff that, you know, when you write a play, at least us, we don't think about. We just thought about Hallie and the and the federal theater we didn't think about the business of show business yeah. which is really mm, yeah. problematic for us well in the end tell us again how many how many people were reached by the federal theater project in terms of audience so 500,000 a week uh 500,000 a week a week a over week. A week. over 4 years yep so yeah. One of our one of our attendees was was wondering what that basically musing that um, these were um, was theater for the masses for the working the working yeah. people yeah. and just wondering what what if there was a, a theater created today that was um, you know for popular entertainment can can you can you think about how how uh, that might look or the impact it might have i i i don't think i've got hallie flanagan's vision you know i think they were desperate times as i say and i guess it's in my subtitle but they led to you know desperate measures um i, I don't know if you could mobilize the kind of energy 
you know, I think they did at the time. Yeah. uh, First of all, I mean, when we say theater for the masses, it was, but they did Shakespeare, they did Chekhov, and it wasn't, uh, it it wasn't uh, a cheap entertainment. uh, Some of it. They did cheap. They did cheap entertainment too. But they did uh, both. (laughs) They did everything. They did everything. But capitalism was on the ropes then. Yeah. And that's what allowed, uh, you know, public support of the arts. Uh, now, uh, capitalism is in trouble, I think, and there's great inequality in the country, but it's not on the ropes. And, and I don't think there will be, there is a willingness to do what, uh, what we did in the 30s, you know. It's just not there. Capitalism and, and uh, profit is a motive is too strong still. Yeah, and there's great suspicion of any kind of public programs and support for public programs beyond the bare minimum. Yeah. So the arts, you know. No. I tell you, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been a, a really wonderful and sort of past moving conversation, but, but we're out of time. <laughs> so I wanted to thank you for being with us tonight. This has been a wonderful conversation. Um, thank you. And I'd like to thank everyone who joined in and thank you for your questions. Um, you can learn about our upcoming events at livingnewdeal.org. Um, and if you'd like to support our work, we would welcome it. Keep our programs in the arts uh, coming to people everywhere. So good night. Thank you again. Good night.